Good afternoon. Uh, welcome to this week's uh, NextRev Power Hour. I will be your host. My name is Alberto Mazzarotto. Uh, today we're going to talk about the benefits of history-free modeling, uh, basically highlighting a tool that uh, CPC acquired in about 2007 called CoCreate, now known as Creo Elements Direct. Uh, as I get started, I, I will pause momentarily to ensure that we're not having any audio or video issues. Uh, if you are experiencing a problem, uh, there is a chat window within GoToMeeting. Please type it in there, and like I said, I'll, I'll be keeping my eyes open there. So if there are any problems, I will uh, I'll take a look at what's going on. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, just very briefly, I'll go over the agenda. We'll start off with uh, who's next friend, as well as uh, power hours that we'll be having in the future. Uh, we do offer an extensive list of online, I'm sorry, of instructor led courses. And then we'll move on to the meat of this uh, presentation, which is uh, the pains of rigid modeling and the benefits of history pre modeling, followed by the demonstration and finally some QA. Um, I, I would like to uh, wait to the end for the questions. I uh, find that uh, there's Kind of speed up the uh, the uh, presentation a bit, so if you could just hold off the questions, and at the end I will give you some time for them. So Next Rev has been around uh, for a little over 11 years now uh, in the Bay Area, although we do have offices in northern, I'm sorry, in the Pacific Northwest as well as Southern California, uh, with well over a thousand local customers. And we're also one of PTC's largest resellers and the number one reseller of a windshield in the Western half of the United States. So some of the power hours um, that we have coming up, if you go to our website at nextrev.com forward slash training forward slash power hours, you will see some of the power hours that are uh, scheduled uh, in the future. We are currently underway with getting all of our old power hours archived on the internet, uh, and that should be done very, very shortly. We've been kind of um, getting a new, uh, a new host, so we have to re-upload all of these, but you will have access to all of our old power hours. We do offer training, uh, instructor-led training, for nearly everything that PTC offers, uh, as well as Creo Elements Direct, which we'll be covering today. But as you can see, by some of the classes that we have there, uh, we can also uh, basically uh, make the classes a little bit more uh, pertinent to your company's need if you want to have us uh, come on site or if you simply want to have the class dedicated to your company and your engineers. Uh, before I get started, I'm double check to make sure that we're not having any audio problems. It looks like looks like we're all set over here. So I am going to continue. Yeah, if there are any problems, please type in the, uh, in the chat box, and I'll I'll check from time to time. So pain points of rigid modeling. By rigid modeling, of course, I mean parametric modeling, any kind of parametric CAD tool, uh, be it Pro Engineer, Creo, uh, Creo Parametric, SolidWorks, Inventor. These are all parametric CAD tools, and they're all going to have the same kind uh, of issues in some cases. For example, imported CAD data. You can start off by bringing it to step or I just file, but you're really not able to do much with it. Yes, you can cut material out. Yes, you can fill some stuff in, but really, unless you're using Creo Parametrics flexible modeling, there's not much you can do with it. On top of that, if you are setting files, by the manufacturer and they're using a different tool than you are, once again, you're stuck in that same step and I just issue. Uh, on top of that, let's just say you're dealing with uh, <clears throat> CAD data that is either very, very poorly defined or very rigidly defined. And I've seen this in uh, Pro Engineer all the time where you have a, uh, a design that is very rigidly defined, beautifully constructed. However, when it comes to those late stage design changes, uh, you effectively have to rebuild the model because it wasn't built with that in, uh, that in mind. And this ultimately leads to a tremendous amount of time waste. Redesign and is going to increase the amount of resources that you're, you're putting into this, uh, this design, increase your time to market, and decrease profitability. Now, if we talk about history free modeling, of course, by history free modeling, I mean uh, Creo Elements Direct, formerly known as CoCreate. So we are actually able to use this dumb information, these step files, these digest files, and build on them because explicit modeling, as it's known, 
doesn't care about history. It doesn't care about the steps you took to create it. It doesn't care about parametrics. And I know that if you are used to parametric modeling tools, what I'm saying sounds a little counterproductive, but I assure you, what we're talking about here with direct modeling is going to allow you to speed up design time in many cases. Uh, we're going to go over data reuse, starting with a model that we've completed and at the last minute have to update everything and change its entire purpose. We're not going to have to deal with these rigid or more poorly defined parametric models because Elements Direct does not care about any of this parametrics. Lastly, our prototype design is incredibly rapid. It's a very easy to use tool because although engineers can pick up parametric modeling very quickly, non-engineers tend to struggle a bit because, let's just face it, an engineer's mind works the way an engineer's mind works. And in some cases, dealing with uh, non-engineers um, might make an engineer have to spend a lot of time redesigning. Well, Elements Direct won't require that because it's a very, very simple tool to work with. Now, both paradigms have their strengths and their trade-offs. Okay, with parametric modeling, you are able to capture this design intent that you re that you're required to to capture. With explicit modeling, you don't. You skip all those parameters, you skip all those features, and you build what you need to build. Ultimately, this is going to provide you with a very very lightweight tool, whereas parametric tool with modeling does give you a powerful uh, approach to actually put in all of these. Uh, these parameters, these uh, family-based features that you're, you're putting in. Now, I don't want you to feel that uh, direct modeling is not powerful. But at the end of this, at the uh, end of the presentation, I will go over a list of a few of the clients that use Creo Elements Direct. I would like to get started at this point. I'm going to pause to make sure that we're not having any issues. It looks like we're all set. So at this point, let us get started with the demonstration. So this is the interface for Creo Elements Direct. If you are used to uh, Creo Parametric uh, 1, 2, uh, or even Wallfire 5 in the drawing, uh, drawing mode, you will notice that the ribbon user interface uh, has been transferred over to Creo Elements Direct. And again, even if you've used the Office products from 2007 to current, you will notice this ribbon user interface. So, uh, there is some similarity between the two tools. So I want to pose a, uh, a, a problem here. We are in the process of designing this last slide. I don't know if you guys remember these, but they were fairly popular many moons ago, uh, where you have the, the illumination unit here, you have the flashlight there, and in the back we had a flasher unit. So what we need to do now is complete the design here. Uh, I, I am currently in an assembly, although there is no distinction between assemblies and parts in direct modeling. All of them are stored in the same part file. So at this point here, what I'd like to do is begin drawing. I want to draw on this face, but beyond that, I actually want to use this face uh, as my start geometry. So I want to project, if you're used to uh, create a parametric, I want to project the existing geometry here onto a plane. So that's what we'll do. We'll go to the work plane tool and project geometry. And simply by clicking on a face, I will automatically project that face's geometry onto this plane. Now, with Elements Direct, there's no need to click on extrude or anything of that nature because you simply click on the work plane, pull it forward, and you've created an extrusion. Okay, this is going to work just like clay. You're pulling on clay, you're stretching it, and you're going to ultimately create some sort of a shape. All right. Now the thing is, I don't really care what the overall length of this feature is. What I do know is that the overall length of the entire part needs to be 450 millimeters. So I'm going to click on this reference uh, collector here, and I'm going to drag it to the back of the part. So I know that we need 450 units. And uh, I'm actually going to expand this particular feature here, and I am going to create a new part. I want this part to be called a red lens. Uh, 
my work plane, what I've done with it, I don't need it any longer. And I know this is a bit odd for someone that's used parametric modeling. You don't use a, a data plane or create a data plane, create your extrusion, and then get rid of your data plane. We need those. Those provide our parametrics. But in elements direct, it's not such thing as a data plane. There's no such thing as parametrics. Once we complete the extrusion, we don't need that plane any longer. You can keep it if you'd like, but in this case, we don't need it. So I'm going to get rid, uh, clear out, keep work plane, complete this, and we are going to have our brand new part here. Now, just like an assembly structure, we can go ahead and put this in our red light subassembly. And I created this offline. So I'm just going to drag it in there. And now we see that under red light, we have our, our bulb and our lens. So let's continue to make some modifications to this lens over here. First off, I want to get rid of these rounds because this is kind of a boring shape. And again, it's not 1989 anymore. We have tools that allow us to make very, very fluid shapes. So let's get rid of this feature here. I'm going to simply select on this chamfer, or I'm sorry, this round, and delete it. And while this tool is active, I will delete this other one. Then I click the complete, and those are gone. And now what I'd like to do is these these little recesses here that gave us some kind of a, you know shape to it. Well, I want to put a round at the uh, on the edge of this face here. That's going to cause me some problems. So what I want to do is blend these out of there. We can start with it. You know why not? Uh, but I want to end where it's flat. So what we're going to do is actually create a sketch on this face here and extrude to add material to fill in some of the areas we don't want to have used. So anybody that's used Creo. Uh, parametric or any parametric CAD tool understands about selecting a face and starting to draw. So I'm just going to select a face and put a work plane. And I projected the construction geometry of the geometry on this face. In fact, what I'm also going to do is put in a couple of construction lines. I'd like to have a parallel line to this face here. We'll put it in at 10 units. And in fact, I'd also like to have a bisector which is, I'm going to use later on as a center line. So I've got some geometry set up here. And now we can simply begin to create our, uh, our actual geometry. So this is a line tool, just like you see in any parametric modeling tool. Mm -hmm. But what I'd like you to, uh, to see here is that what we're about to do uh, it's a big no-no in any, in any parametric CAD. So what I want to do is actually add material to the back of this. So let's, let's go about first creating a sketch. I am going to create a mirror plane simply by referencing this line that I just created. And I was able to do this by clicking on the line tool and pressing the space bar to bring up a submenu. So I'll click on this line. Now I want to show you what happens. As I move the cursor to the top plane, on the lower plane, we have a matching cursor. So I really only need to do this twice. I'm sorry, uh, once. So I'm going to start here at one unit. And I am going to go to my left, click there, and make the shape. And I, I think you can see what I'm trying to do. I'm, I'm basically just going to blend out this feature. And because I am here, it, it did another one on the bottom automatically. So I'm going to complete that. And now, select the work plane once again and drag it in the direction that I would like to add material. Now, because there's already material there, it's going to default to remove material. So I'm going to expand this and go under operation and ask it to add material. Now, in a direct uh, parametric, excuse me, a parametric modeling tool, you don't do this. If you want to fill a hole, you remove it. You don't add material to plug it up. So I can see where you might be a little bit hesitant here, but in direct modeling, these things don't exist. You're not ruining the model tree by adding a step which is making you save time to do it the right way. This is the only way to do it in parametrics. Think about modeling and play, or think about simply working with um, with machining material. You're taking material away from an overall boolean or a block. So I don't care what this value is, because the minute I set this complete, this is all going to go away. I'm not going to remember that I ever even created all this. I'm going to remove the key work plane and complete.
complete this. As simple as that. So we made added this little feature here. Same on the bottom. And now we can go in and add a little bit, little bit of a little bit of style to this part. So I'll click on this edge, and I'm going to go over here. Now, when I click, by the way, uh, when I click on a feature, it's only going to give me a few options that may be most pertinent to what I'm working with. So in this case here, uh, I'm going to select uh, a variable blend. Now, all of these tools are available in the ribbon, but again, if you say, okay, well, you're looking at an edge, most likely you want to do one of the following. So I'm going to click on a variable blend. I want the end as one unit here, and I want this end as six units. And while this tool is active, if I click another edge, it will apply that same parameter on the other edge. I now want to click this back face, and it's automatically going to default to a standard constant radius uh, blend or a round. All right, and I want to have all those rounds at six units as well. So what we've done is it's given this a bit of a bit of style. Okay, it's a little bit boring than it would have been had I just kind of let this go. Now, as I'm building, just, just take a look at the in the structure browser here to the left. This looks a whole lot like what we have in Creo Parametric or any parametric tool. But these are simply a list of parts. This is a part, this is a subassembly, a subassembly. We should expand that and see the other parts. There is no structure. It doesn't exist in parametric in, uh, excuse, excuse me, in explicit or direct modeling. Now what I'd like to do is simply highlight this, this lens here. And actually, I want to just do the lens, excuse me. And now we are going to shell this. So I click on shell. It's asking me what part I'd like to shell. So I'm going to double click on web lens. And offset wants to know the thickness. So I will do two units. And open face is just what it sounds like, the face that we actually want to have opened up. So we can see that this is just about what I want to work with. I'm going to complete that. It doesn't look much like a red lens, though. So if I right click on the part in the structure browser and go to properties, I will have the ability to change all that. Nothing spectacular here. Make it semi-transparent, so close that. Reactivate everything, and we can see what I have created. Okay, I'm going to pause for a moment. Make sure there's no uh, there's no problems here. It looks like we're all set. Okay. At this point here, I'd like to create an exploded view. So what we're going to do now is go under structure, and you'll see the explode option there with the little bomb. B-O-M-B is not to be confused with the B dot O dot M dot, which we'll also do in this demonstration here. So let's click on it. Let's click on explode. The first thing it's asking is for an existing configuration which we don't have. We will go over that a little bit later, so I'll ignore for the time being. I want to do a new configuration. Owner wants to know what assembly we're going to explode. So I'm going to click there and double click on our main light assembly. And then we'll give it a name. We're doing the same thing that we would do in Creo Parametric, where we're simply going to create a view state. So I'm going to give it the name of flash light. All right. And Accept these features, and now we are going to simply move them around. And we'll do a dynamic positioning. So let's just select this face here and drag it this way roughly. You can apply value. I really don't care about the values. I just want them to look good. And then uh, in order to select a new feature, you click back on objects and select the new feature. So we'll drag this up here and drag this down. And lastly, I'm going to select this lens here in the back and drag you out. Okay. Now, obviously, there are more parts here, but in the interest of time, I think this will this will work fine. Let's complete that explode, and we can see that underneath the main flashlight assembly, we have a view state, which is flashlight. And if I right click on that and deactivate it. It'll unexplode this. And you know, you always will have flashlight as an option to explode or unexplode here under.
your information assembly. But I think for the time being, that looks uh, this looks just about right. And we will move on to creating a drawing. So under Applications, you are going to have a button there that's called Annotations. You will need to turn it on the first time you, you do this. Basically, you have to uh, boot up a new tool, as you would think. Think of it that way, of uh, the 2D mode, or the Annotations mode. Uh, this is in the base package. I'm like, you have to buy this. Uh, to turn this on, you right click on uh, where it says it has these little arrows pointing down here. I should just left click on those, excuse me. Go to Applications and turn on your annotation mode. If you have other tools like uh, Sheet Metal, Cabling, FEA, you would do it here. But in this case, just turn it on with annotation. Give it a moment as it does have to boot it up. It does it this way to, to reduce our memory consumption. So we'll click on Annotations, and we're in a brand new Annotations tab. Now, mind you, this has changed a bit. Um, we're still in the ribbon, but all the tools are different, as now we are in a 2D mode. So I'm going to click on New Drawing. And once again, Owner, it is defaulted to red light, because that was the last one we worked with. However, if I double-click it, it will actually bring me back to our light assembly. So here we go. So we can click on the light assembly, which is what we want to work on. What I want to highlight for a moment is front direction and up direction. It just so happens that this is currently oriented the way we want it. But if it were not, we will click on front direction, come in here, and either click on an edge that we want to be um, facing in a certain direction. For example, right now, the edge here that I've selected is going to be facing away from me since the arrow is pointing toward me. If I hit tab, it'll flip it around. I find it a bit more uh, user-friendly to click on face. So in this case here, if I click on this front face, because the arrow is pointing toward me, it will be the back face. Click on tab, it will now be the front face because your viewing uh, plane has changed. So we'll make that the front, and the up direction is going to work the exact Way. Just click on an edge that you want to have pointed up, or a face that you want to be looking at. Here's where we select our sheet. Uh, configuration we're going to work with in a moment, so I'm going to ignore that for a minute. And I am going to add the views. And under uh, this area here, under orthogonal views, we can't select the views we want or even our ISO views. But for the time being, top, front, and right is what I do want to work with. I'm going to put it right about right about here, I think. Okay. We wanted the green check mark or center click. Same as uh, create parametric center to complete, and it is going to generate these views. The next thing I want to do is add another view, but we're going to add an exploded view. So under configurations, which I said we get to in a minute, under configurations we have our flashlight configuration, which is exploded. I can also put in a different scale. I think we'll do one to uh, one to three, and do a right top back view. I should think right top front would be a little bit better. And that doesn't work. Any else changes. So I'm going to center click and place it there. Center click to complete, and there is our our exploded view as our ISO view. I know you know I wouldn't do that, but again in the interest of time. At this point here, let's add a, let's add a cutaway view. So I'm going to select the right view. I'll do that again. I'm going to hover over the right view, left click the selected, and we have this little mini toolbar that pops up. So I'm going to click on cutaway. Uh, if you look closely at the cursor, you see three little dots. What that means is that we can actually expand this menu here, or right-click to get additional uh, additional options. I want to create a spline to select this area here. So I'm going to just click here, roughly. When I'm done, I can right-click again and accept that shape. It puts me into my 3D viewport now because the cutaway not only needs an area to cut, but a depth to cut too. And this could not be simpler. So there is my cutaway view that I did. And if you look here, depth, it wants to know by point, face, or uh, work plane. And I just know that I'm going to use a point. I'm going to select this point right
right about here, and it's going to project that cut to that depth. Static is complete. Give it a moment while it regenerates, and there is our cutaway view. I can move this a little bit here. It looks like it's misspelled cutaway, uh, so we can select it. Actually, change the the uh, preferences of the text by going here. Oh, right there, edit the text. We'll put a space. Maybe put a dash in there. The little green button there, and it's updated our text. So that does cut away a instead of what it said before. Okay, next let's put in a section view. So I'll click this view here, and once again the mini toolbar pops up and there is create section view. So if I hover over this edge here, okay, and press the right mouse button, I actually want to do a two point line, which is exactly right. And I always can press the space bar to expand my section view options here. So it's asking me what I want to do, and I want to have a section line, and I will place it, snap to the center there, and place the line right there. Okay, left click, I'm sorry, right click to accept section line, and there is our section line. And of course, I can flip it around by clicking up reverse direction, for example. Center click to complete, and I can place it now. If I hover over the view for a moment, You'll see these center lines, these green center lines. Those are projected off the view that I'm hovering over. If I snap to it, it turns pink. Let's put it right there. And it's going to generate that view, and there we have it. While this view is here, let's go ahead and put a detail view in. So there's my detail view option. Uh, I can right click and select what I actually want to create. Once again, I'll just work with the spline. Why not? Let's put the detail view. Right there, right click to accept that spline set, and open up our options here. I think I have the scale at one to one. Be good. Uh, the current scale is uh, one to two, so it can be a bit smaller. <coughs> one to one, maybe a bit larger, and that works for me. So I'm going to turn to the complete. We'll place it right about there, and there is my detail view. The last thing I want to do uh, before I start actually dimensioning is to add a bill of materials. So what we have to do is scan the model first. We'll scan all levels of the model. Uh, note that assembly is defaulting back to red light because that was uh, still active in the assembly. But if I click on assembly, double click on light, it will uh, reactivate the top level assembly. I'll, I'll do that once more. I'll click on assembly and then the structure browser does appear. So in case you're wondering where I clicked, when we click there, it's going to give us an option to select something here. So there is uh, the light level, that, uh, the light assembly that I wanted. So I will scan the model. Here's the quantity of everything and the part name. However, I don't actually have a number assigned to each one of these. So if I go under Manage and File Numbering, I can create sequential steps. So I can run that, and you'll see that my current number has not uh, changed. And lastly, let's actually place the tape. So we'll place it on the lower right. Draw the table up. It'll snap to my cursor, and I will just drop it right there. Okay, it did snap to that edge and the top of the title block. So complete that, and complete that. Uh, we can also add bomb balloons. So I'll do that right now while we're here. Uh, they do call them position flags, so we'll go under bomb flag create, and uh, it will default to snap to the uh, to the geometry. So when it highlights yellow, it means it does not yet have a bomb boot assigned. So let's just click on a bulb here, put the bomb boot there, uh, and click on this housing there, put the bomb boot right there. This housing there, bomb balloon, and so on. We're basically, basically clicking on various housings to place the bomb balloon in uh, good areas. All that that'll be fine for now. I don't want to. I don't want to deal with that too much. And obviously, if I zoom in, you can see the option here. Uh, the particular option here is ISO. It doesn't actually have the circle around it. But one of the other options is I'm going to show you right now. Um, 
data option does actually do the balloon. So let's place that one there. We can see the balloon right there in yellow. So that can be changed to black, of course. All right. This is a drawing, so I think the drawing needs some some dimensions. So we'll start with a datum long. I'll show you what that means in a moment. And I'll select this edge to this edge, place that, and we'll select this edge, and it's automatically going to propagate the dimension so that you don't have to actually deal with the spacing. And let's add maybe some additional ones. Maybe up here, an overall link you can drop in here. And I'll, I'll reorganize the views right now because it is a bit in the way. So I'll select this view. Select this view and this view. I press shift by the way to do that. And we'll hover over and just drag it down. Just like it. give it some more square footage up there. We have plenty of space. You might as well take advantage of it. And maybe we'll drag you a bit down. Okay, very good. Apparently, I didn't click, uh, select that one there, so we'll just select that point, click that point, and there we have it. Okay, very good. Add maybe a radial dimension on this edge here. Very good. Okay. So, this is going to be our drawing. I think everything here uh, looks just about the way we need it. Unfortunately, we have now been told that since 1989, no one has bought these flashlights. So we need to actually change this up a bit and make it more pertinent to today's needs. So what we're going to do is go back to our modeling tab here and make some very extensive late stage design changes. Before I do that, I want to make sure that there aren't any problems here. It looks like we're all set. All right. What we need to do now is put this flasher on both sides of this flashlight. Okay, so we need, that means we have to get rid of this light assembly here. We have to completely change this area here uh, near the flashlight over there. And it's going to be quite the extensive project. Now, for a moment, in the parametric man, uh, modeling tool, just, just think about how you would do this. So if you know how to use any parametric tool, what is involved in taking this whole half and having it on this half as well. So in the meantime, I am going to take our flashlight, which is just this, uh, this bulb here, and I'm going to delete it. No longer needed. However, what I also want to do is because really the only thing changing here is this housing and this battery cover, I'm going to hide the others just so that they're out of my way. And I'm now going to go to my Boolean command here and reflect. So by parts, what I have to do is uh, I have to actually create a selection list. So you do that by right-clicking and going to Cache, Select Show, and Start Select List. Double-click on what you want to have they put up here. So I want battery housing, I'm sorry, battery cover and housing. Right-click, go back to Cache, Select Show, and Select Done. Now, plane, it wants to know what plane to mirror. Okay, that's again, if we know how to use parametric modeling, we understand what it's looking for. I am going to right click and go to point and direction. Now, you, we can also put a work plane in here, but that's just one additional step. Point and direction is, just, is going to ask you a specific point, and then it will mirror about that point, and it will ask you how you want to do that. So, I want to actually come in here and select this edge right here on the part. The problem is, you see the little cursor, where, where's the midpoint? It's just going to drag all over it. If I hit Control Shift, it will snap to the midpoint of any entity. So if it's the circle, the center of the, of the circle. If it is a, uh, a linear edge, the center of the linear edge. If it is a cylinder, it'll select the center of the cylinder about a certain space. So again, Control Shift. Control shift, that's my center point. I'm going to left click to select that. And now it assumes I want to mirror that way. No, that's not right. If I hover over an edge, it'll move around. So I want to mirror 
this side here, I'm circling, over this side. So I need to make sure that it mirrors in that direction. That, it just so happens the arrow is pointing in the right direction. But if it weren't, once again, tab, we'll flip it around. So I want to mirror that direction. I'm going to left click and then center click complete. And it has mirrored not just the battery or the housing, but the battery cover as well. Unfortunately, now we have this little tiny worthless handle that we can get two fingers in, but we're going to deal with that later. So, okay, we've, we've mirrored it, but now if I turn my red light on, well, this isn't going to do the trick. I need to actually mirror all of the geometry on this side to put it on this side as well. So, let's select the red light, go to where it says Modify 3D, and under More, we're going to have Mirror. Okay, so for parts, it is once again defaulting to the lens that we did, so make sure you double click on the entire the subassembly so we get the ball, the, the, the features that actually make the subassembly function on the other side. And it's asking once again for a mirror plane. So what are we going to do? Same thing as before. But before I forget, let's make sure we copy that light. Otherwise, we're going to get something new and I'm not going to know what the heck it, what the heck it is. Mm -hmm. So let's call it a red light copy and go back to my mirror plane. I'm going to right click in space once again and go to point and direction. Hover over this edge here. Left click to complete and select mirror in this direction to the right. Center click and there is our mirrored feature. So let's turn on the clear light once again. This is what we've got here. All right. We do, however, have to focus on a bit of an issue, which is this handle, which is only good for a toddler. I am now going to go to my battery cover here, and I'm going to activate it. So set it active. This way, when I select something, it doesn't inadvertently select another, another part or subassembly. I am going to select this whole left half of the part. Now, in a parametric tool, how would you do this? Let's assume for a moment that you simply drew the profile on a plane and extruded it bidirectionally to create this handle and you added some rounds. So to change it, you have to go back to the sketch. Let's once again assume you didn't create this, it was your colleague. Go to the sketch edit the definition of the actual sketch and change everything. And who knows what reference this handle down the line. You could create a tremendous amount of problems depending on what children this handle has. So in direct modeling, we would care less. The children don't exist the way they do in parametric modeling. I can simply select this feature. I realize it's going to move it in the incorrect direction. Therefore, I can select any, any edge to reorient the move. I'm going to drag it to the left uh, about 60-ish units. Not ish, but actually maybe 60, so extra. It's going to regenerate that. Set it to complete. And I just drag it over. That was all I did. I just selected an area and, and pulled it to the left. However, I want to ensure that people understand that this is up and this is down. So I am going to select this entire top half of this feature and click on stretch and select, once again, select an edge. Oops, excuse me, wrong edge there. Select this edge to move it about. And now what's going to happen is it's only going to move that top portion. Those two pylons aren't going to move. So let's move to the last 20 units. Let's see what's going to happen. And bear with it. There's a lot of geometry that's moving. So I'm going to left click to accept that. Center click to complete. And we are going to update all of that geometry. And again, in any parametric tool, how long would this take? Two seconds like I did just now? Or would you have to do a significant amount of redesign and re-referencing to create this particular geometry? We'll give it a moment. Again, there's a lot going on here, so let that, uh, let that update. And there we 
have it. Okay, so here's our, our new shape. Uh, now, we are going to have to fix the, the explode view because, well, the flashlight assembly is gone. So let's go back to structure and go to our explode. And under configuration, because an explode view exists, we can go back to it. So let's look at configuration. Click on flashlight, and here's our explode. What we're going to have to do now is simply click on uh, dynamic positioning, select an object. We'll select this object here and drag it to the right. And that looks good. Complete that. Let's deactivate to this explode. And now let's see what's happened in our, our drawing. Your first thought is, nothing happened. Okay, it's the exact same way it was before. What we have to do now, recreate everything. Now, just because this is a direct modeling tool, it doesn't have that history that parametric modeling tools do. It is still an associative modeling tool, which means that once I regenerate everything here, everything will come back. Let's update the views. And we'll update the entire sheet, green check mark, We'll give it a minute because now basically it has to regenerate every single view uh, to rebuild it in the 2D model. Now while this is doing that, for a moment what I do want to specify is although this is not a parametric modeling tool, with advanced assembly features that you can have, you are able to put in parametrics. So if you do want to have certain things related, you are still able to do that in direct modeling. All right, we can see that we have updated everything. I this view is going to be a problem because it is in the way now. So let's drag it to the right. And here is our updated view. All right. This does complete the demonstration. At this point, let's go ahead and uh, finish up the, the presentation. Uh, I'm, I'm not noticing any problems here in the chat box. So I will just go ahead and continue here. So I'll kind of recap real quick. Uh, the interface, again, the interface is nothing new to anybody that's used Office 2007 to current, as well as anybody that's used Creo Parametric or any other uh, PTC tool like uh, Creo Direct or even Creo Illustrate. We've kind of switched to this entire ribbon user interface. Now, mind you, depending where you are, whether you're in the annotations, uh, field the model the 3D modeling field. Uh, searching for your applications, you can see the other applications which are available, or even the mini toolbars. Um, the interface is, is pretty self-explanatory. We talked about how to create parts, how to modify assemblies, and how to use those assemblies to create those parts. Talk about drawings, uh, how to actually place the views, creating section views, detail views, uh, cutaway views, as well as placing the explode views, and then at the end went over the associativity of Creo Direct within the drawings. The highlight, I think, was the late stage design changes to not only take an entire part, or I'm sorry, an entire product and completely uh, repurpose it, but even take complex geometry and modify it. And again, what I did here is a relatively simple part due to the amount of time we have to work with. But this is one of the most powerful aspects of Elements Direct, is to take these products and completely repurpose them. If you were curious to some of the uh, some of the people that are using Creo Elements Direct, we can see some of the uh, relatively large companies that do leverage the speed uh, and agility of Creo Elements Direct to build very, very complicated project, uh, products. A side effect of not having any kind of parametric history is that a Creo Elements Direct part or assembly file does the same thing is incredibly small when compared to any other parametric modeler. 
And uh, PTC isn't the only uh, company that sees the, the value, or these companies are the only companies that see the value in this, but it's also been a, uh, uh, had many awards given to it due to its, its ability to be used as a product development tool, as a conceptual design tool, and as a large assembly tool. At this point, uh, I would like to open the floor for some questions. We've got quite a few people on this webcast. Uh, so please add your questions either in the chat box. Uh, yes, in the chat box, please, and I will, uh, I will answer them. OK, question one, is this Creo Direct? That's a, it's a great question. <laughs> With the uh, renaming of the products, um, I can see where, where this would come up. So Creo Elements Direct and Creo Direct are both direct modeling tools. Uh, and to spare, a, to spare you all for a 35-minute lecture on why that is, I'll, I'll, I'll cut to the chase. Creo Direct, Creo Elements Direct, excuse me, is formally co-create. Uh, so anybody that has used co-create in the past, this is just a an updated version. We're at 18.1 right now. It will continue to be developed for many, many more years until it is eventually blended into Creo Direct. Uh, I won't talk about why that is, but just know that eventually Creo Elements Direct will be Creo Direct. Good question. Any other questions? I understand that if you uh, if you are used to a parametric modeling tool, that a that what we're working with here can be a bit hard to swallow. So even just simple questions, please go ahead and ask them. Uh, I'm faced with you know, trying to explain the the, uh, the direct modeling paradigm to parametric users quite often. OK, I have a question here about uh, dimensioning. And I, I assume you mean dimensioning in 3D modeling? OK, yeah. Um, the way that you sketch in Creo Parametric is significantly more like creating a drawing on each sketch plane. Uh, the reason that is, uh, it simply put, it's parametrics. In Creo Direct, you, sorry, Creo Elements Direct, I'm doing it now. In Creo Elements Direct, you leverage construction lines more than you ever would in any parametric modeling tool. Those construction lines are where you're going to build your assembly. There's a lot of drawing tools that I was not able to cover uh, due to time that will show you how to actually use these construction geometries to input very accurate geome uh, sketch geometry with all the dimensions that you could ever use to build your sketch to their extruder, revolve, et cetera. It's just done a bit differently than Creo Parametric or any parametric modeling tool. I hope that answers your question, but ultimately, yes, you can put in very, very tight dimensioning uh, in the sketches within 3D modeling. It's a great question. You have a question about assemblies here. So uh, the question is, what's the difference between an assembly and a part if the the uh, the file is the same? So because in Elements Direct you simply have one type of file uh, file extension that's called a PKG. Um, the PKG file is it, it stands for package. It's going to retain everything that you would need for the part, the assembly, the drawing, the detail views, the explode views, etc. All within that. So when you, so effectively, you're always building in the assembly mode. Now you're not going to have to worry about circular references because again, there's no parametrics here, so circular references don't exist. You can, of course, uh, use parametric parameters with the uh, advanced assembly module to put in some of these references if you do want to keep certain things over the line. Um, but ultimately, 
because you're always working in one mode, you work within the assembly. I hope that makes sense. Uh, it, it can be a bit hard to to gather there, but, but ultimately, yes, there is no assembly mode because you're always working in the assembly. I have a couple other questions here. Okay. How would you fix a dimension that is no longer connected? I am. I, I apologize. I. I uh, what do you mean by no longer connected? If you could answer that one, you can answer that in the in the chat box, please. Okay. Until that question is uh, until that's a little more defined, I'll skip that one for the time being. Uh, I have another one here. Will this in past session be posted online? Absolutely. Uh, we are in the process of uploading them, but we have to convert the file format, and it takes forever. So uh, we are hoping to have them posted in a couple of weeks, and that has been one of our big priorities right now because we've had a lot of people asking about when these are going to be posted. So I do apologize, but they will be done shortly. Okay, here we go. Uh, it was on the drawing I made. Let me pull that back up. Okay. So I got the drawing here. Oh, this dimension here. I'm sorry. Okay. I, I, I'm sorry. I didn't see. Uh, I didn't notice that was red right there. That is a great question. So two options. One, delete it. Option two, if we don't want to do that, we can simply put this little drag bar there, snap that to the end, which now exists because obviously since we changed the length, it's no longer did, and complete. Does that make sense? Okay. Sorry, sorry I wasn't quite following what you meant, but that's, that's how you would do that. Of course, option two is simply just to select it and delete it, but you know, where's the fun in that? We can just select the end of a dimension when it highlights in the blue color and drag it and move it around. All right, I'm going to double check with questions here. All right, it, uh, it looks like I've answered everybody's questions. If you do have any additional questions uh, that you may think of later, uh, under the PowerPoint here, uh, you simply uh, here is my my email address. It is Alberto M at nextrev.com. So feel free to shoot me an email if you have any questions, and I will gladly answer them. I hope you enjoyed our webcast today. Uh, have a have a nice Friday and have a safe weekend. We'll see you next week. Thank you very much. Bye.